But yeah. Well, it's a little bit rainy, so uh, a little bit more general. I think I'll just sort of do quite a general type of drive. No, but particular plan. Tracking's going to be quite tricky. That's Craig. All his checks are cool.
This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Everybody, and uh, it seems like the gremlins is at work today. Welcome aboard this live safari. My name is Chris, and with me today on CamOps is Craig, and we also have Rexon out today. And on Dam Cam Kelly will be operating the Dam Cam today. It's a rather rainy day this morning. And I'm just going to start off with this very peaceful herd of impala out here on quarantine. Yeah, it seems like um, the rain has disrupted our transmission today a little bit, but it seems like we are back. Just our apologies. Um, we are, after all, out here in the wilderness, and things do sometimes go wrong. Anyway, I was saying, I'm Chris, and with me today on CamOps is Craig, and then... Rexon is also out today, and Kelly will be operating the dam cam for us this morning. 
Remember, you can send us your questions and comments to hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. And then if you are under the age of 18, you are more than welcome to send us an email and kids questions at wildearth.tv. And like I mentioned, it is slightly rainy, drizzly morning, and it's relatively cool as well, which I think is still very good conditions for animal viewing. So hopefully... It'll be a, a great morning. Well, this is very close to where we found Tlalamba the other morning. And often when you just pause and observe a herd of impala like this, especially out here in the mornings in quarantine, you know, just for a little bit, maybe for about five or so minutes, you can, you can very often sort of almost read if they were disturbed during the night and if there might have been a predator that passed through. However, they seem very calm. But then again, we tend to focus a lot on the big, scary and hairies, you know, the elephants and the lions and so forth. And we... We somewhat uh, tend to forget that Impala is also one of the, probably the most important species out there. Good morning, Tiger Owl. And Tiger Owl mentioned that uh, it would be great to find Tlalamba this morning. Uh, good morning, Tiger Owl. Um, that is partially our plan. We're definitely going to head out towards where we saw her last yesterday. Um, there is going to be some difficulties in terms of tracking. Uh, there's been a bit of drizzle, so it might have covered some of the tracks, but we're definitely going to give it a bash and see if we cannot locate her. I just love the scene. There's uh, something about it. There's big marula trees, the road. It's almost like a bit of a promise, you know, almost like a, a, a bit of a, a sign, like this is where we need to go. During my career as a safari guide, I've seen this many times where guests first land in Africa and usually, you know, en route towards their respective lodges. You know, the first impala you see, you know, the cameras come out, you know, so it's nothing like that first animal you see out in Africa. And most of the time, it's usually impala, the first and last animal that you see. And usually, after about 10 minutes or perhaps the third sighting, they realize that they are very common and, you know, but one thing I always do is to just every now and then just sort of reset and just, just sort of cue people to just watch them. Good morning, Michael Fleetwood. Great to hear from you again. And Michael suggests that a bumble towards the hyena den would be also in order. Michael, 
I'm definitely going to do that as well. In fact, the area where the Lamba was last seen yesterday is relatively close to the Ahina Den. And it's a great suggestion. I think let's just do that. Talking about Ahina, I just heard one. You'll hear that. Well, that sounds like they might just be at the den site. So, without further ado, let's let's head over there. In the meantime, let's go to Rexon to say good morning. Good morning, morning everyone, and a warm welcome in the beautiful, beautiful weather here in South uh, uh, Juma Wildlife, Safari Life. It's such an amazing, amazing day. We just came in here and joined the breathing heart of Impala at Sandy Page. We came here, and a little bit later on, we we're observing on the behavior of the Impala. They were looking more to the north quite a lot in a sign of getting concerned. There might be something that moves into the northern direction. Impala, they can have, they have a very good sense of hearing. They might have had something in the northern direction of Sandy Patch. I believe it will be a great morning, of course, because it's over overcast and a little bit drizzling now and then. It's a very good weather for the predators to move into the area. We still for the last three to four days, wishing for wild dogs to come into the area. We bring this life to you here in, in this area from myself, Rexon, behind the camera, we have echoed this morning. I believe we would like to head more to the north and check what might be concerning this impala in the area. As you can see, amongst this impala, there is a dominant male that is really dominating and you can see checking all the females if there's any young male involved if a dominant male moves into the middle of the head the youngster has to move away because he is the one that uh, at the moment really govern or try to control the whole head itself riding i mean riding sitting is not far around next month the dominant male whoever control the harem is going to mate Let's see what might be in the north in our area. peaceful surroundings, the nature. It's not something I can get in my homeland, so it's wonderful to be able to be live, you know, with, with you guys and feel like you're actually there. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth Guide, whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. With wild dogs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We don't always get to see those, so that's, that's just been amazing. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I wanted to be part of the support of Wild Earth. It brings so much um, to everybody and everything has brought so much to me, especially, you know, it got me through some difficult times myself. I found Wild Earth shortly before I was going to go through some things in my, my own personal life, and it's what got me through, and I know that's a story for many, many, many people, so it's important to me to provide support to that. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Pepper, with a very, very distinct facial patterning 
as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here at Stony Point. The thing I love about Russ is that she's taking good care of us. Eh? She gets us to sightings, like we drive over big blocks. The most memorable experience with Wendy was two nights ago, in fact, last night, when I had a flat tire right in the middle of the herd of 400 buffalo and had to change it right there and then. That was by far my most memorable experience with this trusty old girl. The only thing, tough experience on Rusty would be to forget to charge her. Well, she's only broken down with me once, and it was basically just a loose steering uh, rod that we fixed in the field. We use big batteries to power up everything, so if it happens that you don't charge it, she'll die on you, eh? Since then, she's treated me very well. She's taken me into a number of sightings, and well, it just seems to keep... I love these mornings when things just don't go your way. You know, you got tech issues, rain, and all sorts of gremlins at work, and then just suddenly <laughs> this happens. <laughs> In fact, we were sort of speeding it up to head down to the Ahina den and uh, Craig just suddenly went lap it, lap it in the tree and I hit the brakes pretty hard and nearly killed him. But <laughs> there we go. Well, a little bit far from it, um, because obviously we we somewhat disturbed it in a way. My well, apologies for that; it wasn't intentional. But so just keeping a distance for now, just to let it calm down a bit. She's watching. Definitely watching the Impala or something close by. There's a, bit, a couple of Impala about, probably about a hundred yards away. Good morning, Sir 50. Yeah, this is definitely fantastic. I definitely had some amazing luck with Leopard of late. It's just amazing that there's a Days it goes past when you track and track and track and you just don't find them and then you just come around the corner and here's a leopard in a tree. And it is indeed our Princess Tlalamba, I think. <laughs> now it looks like her. Which which is rather interesting. Because I mean Yesterday we had that carcass that she was feeding on. Obviously, the hyena took pretty much the bulk of it, and she had a good fill. But I suspect that the cubs probably didn't get their fill, and that's probably prompted her to, again, go and attempt to hunt. Now, this type of weather, you know, leopards are mainly nocturnal or rather crepuscular, but... Um, I've often seen in weather like this that they they will hunt well into into daytime, even late morning. You'll probably still see them hunt if the scenario basically is there that they like need to if they are in need of food. I mean, if she retained that carcass yesterday uh, and. Tainas didn't appear a ribbon and, and, and stole her food, uh, she probably would still have been at that kill. I mean, it was quite a large impala male. 
It just shows you how this thing just unfolds and how the whole ebb and flow sort of just continues. It's fascinating how she's sort of making herself smaller. I mean, just incredible how, you know, in, in my mind, that just doesn't appear to be a perfect tree for a leopard to, to climb into. You know, it, it, it seems uncomfortable. It's a lovely pose, but... So what probably happened is she was probably approaching this area. She probably either heard or seen the Impala, and she just wanted a little bit of elevation and climbed up there. But now she's exposed, you know, there's no foliage, and therefore she's deliberately, like, tucking all her limbs in, making herself rather small. Good morning, cousin. Did you have any conversation back to you? Yeah, good morning. We have Tlalamba. She's busy to Lanza Mala here. Uh, on um, Weaver's Nest, just um, south of quarantine. Just calling. Thanks. I'm close to Twin Dams. Uh, can I make my way that way? Yeah, affirmative. No problem. You're more than welcome. Sorry, thank you very much. Just... Um, Calling in some other guys, you know. She's just absolutely fixed on those Impala. It's in fact that same herd of Impala that we opened the show with. And it's gonna be rather tricky. She needs to plan this thoroughly because it's, it's, it's quite a large group of Impala. It's, you know, if I can quickly estimate it, there's over a hundred Impala in that herd and She's got a lot of open terrain to cover in order to get to them. So what I would have done if I was there is just to remain there for now and wait for the Impalas to either m move away so she can reposition and plan an approach or wait for a gap to come down the tree and hide in one of these bushes close by. Craig's just going to quickly wipe the lens uh, with this little drizzle. It does gather a bit of um, moisture around the lens. Oh, like I assure you, we will definitely stay with her as long as we can. We're just going to quickly head over to JP to say good morning. Good morning and welcome to Eco Training Prylands. We started our morning looking for lions and started following up on the tracks of lions. However, we haven't found them yet, but what the tracks did was lead us into the direction of this big group of buffalo. So my name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we've got Johan. 
So it's very likely that these lions are actually trailing this big group of buffalo. And these guys are hungry, and so definitely going to go and try and potentially make a kill. And we'll see that they quite often will follow these big herds of buffaloes. And what they're looking for is individuals that are injured, and that's falling behind, or cows that are very close to giving birth. They also always seem to fall behind, uh, so that they're lacking the energy to keep up with the rest of the group. Other than that, we also look for young little buffaloes, which they can potentially separate from the main group. But when it does come to a big group of buffalo like this, for lions, this can be incredibly dangerous work to try and hunt on a group like this, as if you don't get things right, things can go very wrong for you. And I've often seen things going very wrong for lions, where I have seen both lions being killed, as well as being tossed into the air or chased into dams or into trees to escape from buffalo. They're generally what we find that the defensive mechanism for buffalo is, is to immediately to group the young in the center, females will surround them, and then the bulls will form a defensive circle around the rest of the group. And you can see those big heavy horns and that large body combined with the weight and paws, they can, uh, sorry, and their hooves, they can induce a large amount of injury on a lion, as I've also seen them trampling lions in the past. Now there's a few different individuals that are moving past us, one slightly towards my left, and it seems like a cow. We can see there's a slight separation between the horns and the center, while the one that's closest to us, which has its head fairly low down, busy feeding, as a big bull, and you'll notice that it forms a very large mass, central mass, where it protects the brain. Good morning, Hopper, and welcome to the show. I wonder why they make you feel guilty. And um, I do have to agree with you. It always looks like if you owe them something. There was a little boy that was on safari with us a few years ago, and he was only four years old. I remember for two years ago, I was actually quite amazed that he actually knew who Darth Vader was. And he goes, JP, JP. And I say, yes. And he says to me, the buffalo looks like Darth Vader. And I was very surprised that, as I said, that a four-year-old actually knows who's Darth Vader. I like Darth Vader. I've also got a skull cap. This we mentioned earlier, that skull cap is there to design to protect the brain. And they need that when they are fighting, and the bulls are the ones that fight with one another. And they love to meet one another head on at some speeds of 20, 30 kilometers per hour. We're gonna sit and watch them for a little bit longer and see what they get up to. And hopefully we'll be able to find our lions, but let's go and see what the rest of the team is up to. It's amazing. Wow. Hey. And five, four, three, two, one. Live, live. Oh, that's cool. Just in there. And the black mamba's going up the tree and the mongoose is attacking it. Pounce again. <laughs> sure, you can all agree with me. It's not a bad start to our Wednesday morning. Something that I have never seen before in my entire life that you are now watching live. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Fantastic display by a little herd of springbuck. How is this view? My heart is in my mouth, everybody. Amazing, they've locked their tusks together. You can hear the cracking crunches. It is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin, and it's completely unfazed by my presence whatsoever. How insane is that animal? Amazing. Awesome. It is 
is fantastic to watch. Well, now we've got a tug of war between mom and daughter, look. I'm just at a loss for words here. Yeah. That's just incredible to see that. Welcome back. We're still the same zebra that uh, really into the area of north of Sandy Patch. It's very interesting how actually this animal works. Zebra, impala, kudu, giraffe, buffalo, and all different species. I was just sitting here and thinking, what is the main reason of this impala and wildebeest being in the area? In this surrounding, we know that uh, zebra and wildebeest, they will be only coming here in winter, in Mars, in lots of uh, uh, in numbers. But this year, it looked like they're all coming back early stage, while this area is still thick. And uh, really, this is the ideal for the other species as far as leopard, lions. The habitat itself, it really gives courage of lions to hunt in the air without getting seen by anything. If there's a pride of lion here, they can hunt zebra in this time of the year and get close with that zebra knowing that there's a lion in the area. But the zebra are back in the surrounding. Yes, of course, because of the lion dynamics around in the area, it helps quite a lot. We have seen that the Lamati have moved out of the area. Dark men also move out in the area, headed more to the worse. So that is a cause. We'll be linking back to Chris with uh, the Lamba. just in front of me. All right, she's just gone down now, and it seems like she's decided to to take a, a crack at the herd of Impala. And just a bit of a, a heads up. So we'll, we're probably going to keep a distance as much as we can. So just gone in there. Those impalas are right here. And too much movement could potentially spoil this attempt. I'm going to try and reposition a little bit. Lacquer man, lacquer. I'm probably just gonna sort of stay around here. All right, I reckon we should just probably just go around and reposition there. We don't want to go this way. Let's try it. <coughs> that sounds a bit crunchy. So what I'd like to do when leopards are hunting like this is to remain behind them. But not directly, so you're not in a straight line between them and the intended prey. Sort of almost like at, a, at an angle, so almost forming a triangle. So the reasoning behind that is so the reasoning behind that is, is, is not to 
draw any attention to either the leopard or you know the impala so somebody's going to look at you when you move morning joey and joey says this is a perfect morning for a hunt and yeah i totally agree i just want to see where she is Another thing that I've often seen is that when you sit with a leopard stalking a herd of impala like this, they are clever, those impala. They know that vehicles don't generally sit and watch them for extended periods and they start to get nervous. So sort of almost like they've learned that when the vehicles do that, you know, something's up. Ah, oh, she's, she's, she's gone. Okay, I, I saw her run there. She's gone for the impala. Oh, goodness. She's, she's gone for them. I saw them running there. They're not alarming. Let's just stop and listen here for a bit. No, they seem to have relaxed. They've definitely picked up something. There's one or two impala snorting there, but I can feel the wind moving towards them, so I think they might have just got a whiff in terms of scent, and they're not entirely sure where she is. All right, so while we try and figure out what's happening, let's head over to Rexon, who's got a surprise for you. Wild dogs from a distance, we're getting close here. Wild dogs, they move, but sometimes you have to get in an area in time. Maybe close. But here they are. It's been wild, I mean. Looking for wild dogs in the area to join by the wild dogs. Look like they're coming from Manyeleti and now heading uh, more to the west. So I know that uh, in most cases they will walk along and uh, it will be more. Sorry. Oh, lovely. It's been a long time looking for the dogs. And now this is a perfect weather. It's been drizzling, raining the whole morning. I believe these guys, if we manage to stay with them, we might be able to see the hunt and the kill. Wild dogs, one of the species, of course, in the area are more successful when it comes to hunt because they work in unity. Of course, if you look at the number of dogs, a lot of them, it look like sub -adult. The one that more into the front, I'll get more details when we get close. How many sub and now? How many adults? <laughs> Let's carry on. Linda Polly, thank you so much. It looked like the majority of the uh, dogs, uh, most of them are sub -altered. They go into the headquarters of the anti-poaching, which is really, really close here. Yeah, we'll be getting close and reposition ourselves. Of course, they are very close to one of the camp that really 
situated uh, more towards the gate side. They might cross into Zimbabwe in that direction. We'll see how it works. We'll manage to follow them or not. We'll also update you. But we're very interested to see these dogs today, but especially when it comes to hunting, how actually the information of hunting being uh, really formalized on the dogs itself. It was, it's very, inter very interesting. Seeing they get spotted in Pala, how actually they can, how they move and approach the impala itself. One is directly heading towards the, the gate direction. Well, let's see if we might uh, join them. It look like they're gonna cross into Simbambili. All the dogs have crossed now into Simbambili property. We'll try to, to follow up and see. How city was the was the Friday, my darling? Was the Friday? This is that one. I don't know if you've seen. It. Uh, the guys make soap out of the leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Hey, my sweetie, was the Friday? Langali moni. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, in partnership with WWF South Africa and supported by USAID, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, Wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singli. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. Right, so Mareeps has found himself a puff adder that he's busy playing with, which is dangerous. I've seen leopards die from puff adder bites. I think he got hit on the paw. So he's obviously taken snakes on before. What cost Mareeps? Welcome back to Eco Training Problems. We still have our big breeding herd of buffalo and we've just located the little calf that was born a few uh, a week and a half or so ago. And it's still sticking of a mother and it was actually trying to get a little bit of a drink. And it's great to see that they're now actually keeping up with a group as it you generally find within the first few days that they actually do struggle to keep up with a group. And eventually that leads that the female will actually only move that young calf and then almost part of a day. Not quite sure was startled them at uh, something that was hindering them and we also see that the ox pickers have just flown up 
Uh, your ox because it reduced here over here at the moment is all both red bolt as well as yellow bolt ox pickers we see generally but it's yellow bolts that do associate with them, big herds of buffalo as they feed larger species of ticks We've also noted that there's a number of bulls in the group that are very hard to actually try and mate with some females and in the process they were also trying to keep one another at bay to um, we'll see that only the most dominant individuals are the ones that can will mate. We just want to keep our eyes open and see what's going on. I think this female is looking for a youngster maybe. And is leaving us a bit of a stare. and welcome to the show. What they simply do is that they form large groups and, and by having safety in numbers, that is one of their best assets. And when lions do start with them and they do run, the ones that will become separated is normally the sick, weak and old. And those are the ones that will be taken. Some of the other things that we will see with them is that they will very rapidly start attacking by using their horns or trampling. Those are the typical defense mechanisms that they will use. And that... Um, can inflict some serious injuries. Um, I mentioned earlier, I've seen them killing lionesses in the past. I've also seen one tossing a lioness some three meters into the air after it actually hooked her with the horns. So I wasn't sure what was going on there now with that one. We're just trying to get a better view. We probably might just try and move in in a moment or two and see what's going on in that group. It seems that they've been disturbed throughout the night and it's very likely that the group of lions did follow them. And um, we hope that we're definitely going to find them because their tracks have ended up very close by to where we actually located on this big breeding herd of buffalo. The group itself is probably some 80 to 100 individuals. If I remember correctly, it's the very same group that um, we found on foot with myself and a cameraman called Glenn last year. We spent a, a good amount of time in a tree waiting for them actually eventually to pass. And um, only a half an hour or so later, we managed to get out of our tree and continue our walk in search of some other interesting things. Good morning, Kerry. Yes, I also love the sound that they produce. It's actually one of my favorite animals, although not a lot of people like spending time with buffalo. But for me, they're actually interesting. Their social structure is interesting. Their ways of moving is interesting. And one of the things about their social structure specifically that's for me interesting is that it's not the dominant bulls in this group that's leading. It actually can be male or female individuals that can lead. And we refer to them as pathfinders. And they will determine when they rest, where they feed, where they go to for specific food or when they move towards water. What we do find is that the dominant males are the ones that has access to females which are an estrus and young bulls won't have opportunity to mate because these big bulls will simply beat them up. And what we do then see is that males actually are all dominant over females. But what I do find particularly interesting is that females with calves and foot are more dominant than a female that does not have a calf at that point. And some of the other things that I also do find particularly interesting is also that how quickly they can organize themselves and lodge an attack. And we also know that um, they are one of the most dangerous animals out here, and I mean specifically lodge that attack towards predators. And I've also seen them, how they have effectively tried to actually defend individuals that were taken by lions, and where the lions were trying to kill them, and then eventually pushing the lions off before they could actually perform a kill. But I've also even seen them actually trying to protect carcasses of buffalo that was just killed by lions as well and trying to push them out of that area and away from that um, animal that was killed. Well, it seems if Chris has just relocated in Colombo, we're just going to see if we can get a better view of the herd again and see what's going on there. And then uh, we'll see a little bit later. Let's go and see what Chris is up to. Sorry, one. Wow, 
quite a morning <laughs> so far. <laughs> right, uh, it lowers just behind that little patch of uh, thatched grass. We would see her just now. She's going to appear just now, unless she's somehow given us the slip. Pulling her mother's tricks. No, she is there. Promise. And while we wait for her to emerge, I mean, that clutter of grass that you see there, I mentioned that it's thatched grass, and you know, you know in Africa we love thatch roofs. And this is one of the species of grass that we utilize to create these thatch roofs. But later on, I'll, I'll get you a sample or two of those and just, just elaborate a bit more on that. There we go. So she is moving. So obviously with the Impala that's seen her, she's now not moving as sort of cryptically as she normally would. Almost an exact repeat of the other morning. And quite ironically, almost exactly the same place. They say lightning never hits the same spot twice. <laughs> well, leopards sometimes do move through the same spot twice. get ahead of it a little bit. <clears throat> Sorry. There's a couple of wildebeest up ahead. I doubt whether she'll actually go for them. Good day, Romeo. And Romeo wants to know why those leopards urine or their scent marking. It's actually their urine, but uh, their scent markings smell like popcorn. Um, Romeo, I'm not. I'm not uh, exactly sure what exact chemistry causes it, but it would probably be alkaloids and chemical compounds in the urine pheromones, hormones, and some Easter's that's probably creating that smell, but it certainly does smell like freshly popped popcorn. Like, you can even take, if they like urinate against like a, like a branch, you could literally hold it right to your nose. It's, it does not have a urine-like smell, like normally, you know, I mean, I remember my cat at home, you know, I can't do that, you know. It's, that sounds, that smells like a typical cat urine, but with leopards, it, it, it literally smells like fresh popcorn. <laughs> Interesting, she sent marked here, yeah, the exact same place, a couple of days ago. Now with this drizzle we had, she obviously had a failed hunt, so now she needs to do something. Uh, so with this drizzle, you will have the effect that that sand is now somewhat washed away, washed off. So that's why she just needs to go and... can just sort of like strengthen that odor. Remember you know that scent marking for leopards, is, it, it, it's like a, a, a smell barrier around their territory that they that they do. And the wildebeest are definitely seeing her. Oh, 
whatever she's going to know. Uh, good morning, Tanya. Um, yeah, it will be great if she can get some breakfast for her and the cubs. Trying to figure out where she's gone. Did she go into the bush? All right, we might need to try and relocate her. So let's. Try and do just that. Nothing beats sitting around a campfire at night whilst on safari, listening to the calls of the wild and chatting to your guide. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, then you can enjoy this from the comfort of your home. Imagine hearing bush stories from your favorite Wild Earth guide and reliving their highs and lows of a life spent in the wild. Every month, Wild Earth Explorers will be treated to an exclusive fireside chat, special occasions, hot topics and deep dives into the Wild Earth characters. Everything else is just welling up inside of you, out in nature. You know, some people think I'm weird, but I have an absolute joy. I have a good time. No, I enjoyed myself thoroughly today. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It's the most amazing experience. It's epic to feel the wind in your face, see the, the animals in their natural environment. My favourite part about today is meeting the wonderful Wild Earth team. Afternoon, folks. Welcome. Hi, Jonty. Lovely to meet you. Please jump into Wendy. Cool, thank you. <laughs> to be able to actually travel on the roads to feel firsthand what it's what it's like, it was amazing. My mud wallow today was something totally different and beyond my wildest dreams. The reason I got a ticket to dream was courtesy of my mum that being a, my special birthday, 60th birthday and how much Wild Earth has meant to me during quite a, quite a hard last year. It's just uh, been the most amazing, amazing gift. So there we go, there we go, look. All three in one frame. <laughs> look at that, isn't that cool? Oh, that is so special. That is exactly what we had been hoping for, is all three of them to come together and make the perfect little family portrait. Welcome back uh, from Kalamba. We are now in Impala Plains. We're uh, joining the head of Impala here, which are really enjoying the company of one another. Towards the writing season, of course, if you look at this uh, Impala in front of us, they are trying to lay the, uh, the dominance. Who is the first dominance, second dominance? It's always a competition. We really uh, lost the wild dog. We went directly to the west area where the wild dog was. It was not a great area for signal. Today it's a great day for the wild dog hunting, specific the common species that we have here, which is impala. Let's carry on. We'll, we'll see more of them. Of course, really, I was more more interested and more excited with this wild dog. If they really stay in the area, we'll manage to follow them the rest of the day. Unfortunately, they'll cross into the area where signal this morning is not looking good at all. We decided to leave them maybe late in the afternoon or 
tomorrow morning, who knows, they might be back in the area. Wild duck is one of the species, of course, following them, you'll always really get rewarded, more especially when it comes to hunt. Such amazing species are more successful, as I mentioned earlier on before. You always see kills from wild dog, I believe. If we follow them this morning, we are still a lot more cloudy, very, very cool in the area. It's not that hot, it's still drizzling. It's where the wild dog make uh, lots of kills. And also, within the structure of the wild dogs, what I've realized, there's quite a lot of sub a lot of energy. Of course, they will hunt and make a kill. But we wish ourselves, maybe in the afternoon, maybe tomorrow, they'll come back again in the surrounding. We'll manage to follow them. Brenda, love, I love your comment. Yes, you expect quite a lot if you're out in the bush in this kind of a weather to see wild dogs because wild dogs they do extra more hunting a lot, moving a lot within a, a very short time of a space. The wild dog can cover a few kilometers because they're always like running. In five, ten minutes, the wild dog completely, they might be far from the area of where you might uh, started, uh, look at, or started uh, following them. In two, three, five minutes, they can be crossed over to, from one farm to another, more especially in this kind of weather. We wish to see them again, as I said earlier on, but I know that they were coming from Manjeleti. Possible they will come back and settle around in the area. Wild dog at a stage, what they do, they would like to move in the area where it's quite more open. It's not the first time they know that uh, in this area there's a nice open clearing that we can, they can hunt and be safe all the time. Remember, wild dog, same as the zebra and wallabies, they always avoid where it's lions in most cases. If a lion moves to a block, they'll move on that block to another block all the time, so we're not surprised. We even have lion in the area, so the wild dog will be back in the area and more other species, of course, that compete with the lions. I'm not taking you. Let me slowly towards uh, Gariman Three House area. In the area where we are, we might, uh, again, this is the area of Shidulu and Toto Span. Furthermore, is uh, we might uh, try to find if Tandy and Maribs are back in the area or not. Tlalambas has been found, and we are more excited because we can, can keep the record of Tlalamba where she's moving with the cubs, how big is the cubs and how healthy it is. Most of the time, it's very important to follow leopard that does have cubs and able to record any information that uh, it can really, uh, the leopard uh, shows also the cubs is how actually we can know that the cups of both of them are survived and which uh, last position that we have seen them, where they're going. It's a very good world habituation process that uh, actually following the leopard cups and the young, I mean female and the youngster, because the youngster have to be more relaxed with your cup. Without viewing them, they will be not going to be relaxed. They won't be a, a good leopards of the area. Our baby Ahmad will lucky again. I mean, this is the road where we are finding Shidulu heading out of the area. Maybe she's back again, who knows? I wish if I can see Shidulu cups in this area, Kalamba and Shidulu. We also try, we know that uh, lots of viewers, they really like to see Tandy, even herself. I mean, in the age of Tandy, it's very interesting. She's, she's now very old. We know that in nature, she's really a good leopard. Uh, in most cases, some of the leopards on that age, they will be no longer in the area. They might be killed by other species that they compete at the same time. So for the record of uh, Tandy, of course, in the area, it was great. I would like to, to see Tandy. That's raising. We're coming in the area now and then. We move in the area where she might moving in and out, in order to see and keep that record. I 
I'm now here trying to see who might be in an elephant. Like uh, I've seen lots of uh, elephant tracks that are moving in and out in the area. At the moment, we have a high density of elephant in the area. I'm not sure how many in numbers, but uh, we might, uh, in the area of Juma, we might uh, have over 100 elephant easy. Again, from last night, because it was really overcast, most of the leopard uh, were trying to check on the ground, drag mark, checking up in the tree. We were a little bit disturbed when we uh, really find the wild ducks. We were following a drag mark of a hyena. We wanted to backtrack where the hyena was coming from. It might be uh, stolen from the leopard, right very close to the gate on that area. We might be in that surrounding. If it's not Kara, it would be Zutini that we have seen, or Shiduru itself. It happens quite a lot when the young, I mean females, because in body they're not compared to the male. Males would be easy if they kill something big as an male, male, immediately a factor will take it up into the tree. But females have to reduce the weight, then they can take it easily. To me, uh, I wish to see uh, Tawangu women or Toto spend on a kill because it tells if we're able to see them on a kill, they will stay at least for two, three days in the same area not to move. But at the moment, because of dominant males, they cover huge distances during the course of a night or in the course of a day because they have to patrol the area. Without patrolling the area, it might be so much dangerous to the cubs because they rely on They depend on the father's strength to stop other males not to come into your territory. Let us see what Chris is up to. Yeah, so we're also going to do exactly the same. We are bumbling. Um, however, I'm just going to head around towards Rebecca's and just check, you know, just if the llama doesn't uh, emerge there. I'm, I'm not actively going to try and follow up. She's gone into the drainage uh, between quarantine and uh, Rebecca's. You know, there's that very, very thick drainage, there, like a lot of terminalias and red bush willows. It's, it's, it's impenetrable. Uh, we just couldn't keep following her. And, I mean, just look at this. This is thick. But uh, maybe if we are lucky, she will emerge. But, you know, other than that, we had a great sighting. But when she was up in that tree, that was just absolutely Gorgeous. I'm so thrilled that Rex got to get to see those dogs. Eh? <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. Hi, good morning, Cielo. Uh, I'm trying just to do some maths here. Uh, you know, how old the Lumbus Cubs? I remember that. My previous shifts, late November, early December, they were tiny. Uh, so that's about a month and a half ago. They can't be older than three months. They must be uh, three, three and a half-ish, uh, according to my very patchy memory. Four months, probably at best. And having seen them yesterday, you know, it, it sort of confirms, you know, visually. It's the age where they're going to start. We're probably going to start seeing them more and more at carcasses, you know, when once she's killed something and secured it. Uh, 
she will go back fetch them. This is that edge now where we'll see a little bit more of that. We're going to slowly but surely start moving with her at times. Well, I only saw the one cub yesterday, but Cedric did see both of them later on when he went back there to just keep, obviously, tabs on her position. Well, it sounds like JP has found some big cats. So let's head over and see what he's got. Welcome back. We eventually did catch up with our lions and we took a, a little bit of a, a guess and which direction they were going to go. And we actually tried to follow up on the track and just found a track and then Johan was actually spotted them as well. I started looking at the tracks on the road. I can't see all of the individuals in the moment, but this specific breakaway group, there's approximately six of them in the group now, and two of us are adult females, while the rest is youngsters. You can see one of them is busy grooming himself at the moment, while the other is still catching up on a nap. I wonder where the others are, and if the adults are potentially trying to follow up on those buffalo, as what I thought they were doing. And that's how we actually managed to locate our buffalo this morning, was actually by following the tracks of this group of lions. It's actually quite dangerous work for a small group of lions like this where there's only two lionesses to try and actually go for buffalo. But I'm sure that they will always keep their eyes open for somebody that's falling behind in the group. In general, when it does come to any predator, they will always go for the easiest possible prey item to take because you don't want to risk injuring yourself in the process, especially when you are a lion. If you are injured, it means that the rest of the group is going to outcompete you when it comes to the dinner table. If you're a solitary predator, such as a leopard, it just means that you can't successfully hunt and that you can potentially go hungry or starve in the next few weeks if you don't get a meal. Well, we're going to hang around a little bit longer and see what our lions are going to get up to. But in the meanwhile, let's go and see what the rest of the team is doing. At Wild Earth, our explorers are treated to a weekly newsletter, bursting with fascinating features and never-seen-before snippets. Recently, we have added some brand new sections which we think you will love. Find out what happens behind the scenes with our crew when they are not live on Wild Earth. Have a giggle at our moments of the week from both Safari and Penguin Beach. And Ranger Steph answers your questions with fascinating and in-depth explanations as to the whys and hows of nature. 20 yards away from one of the most endangered species. All of this and more delivered to your inbox every week. So what are you waiting for? Head over to our website, sign up to be an explorer and join the adventure. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Stanley is such an awesome African penguin and personally my favorite. I love Stanley because of that amazing plumage variation, that beautiful broad black breastband with the cutest little white heart directly in the middle. And Stanley plays hard to get, but we are so happy to have him down here at Stony Point and can't wait to share Stanley's life with you. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. Can you see them? They are right here. 
I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. The bushwalk feed allows the camera person some creative license. This is my favorite style of shooting. You have to be mentally and physically prepared. You're shooting handheld in some very strange and contorted positions, always with a straight back, often in the squat position, low to the ground. The creativity comes down to the relationship and sync you have with your presenter. The more you understand each other, the more you'll be able Welcome back. I've just noticed uh, this elephant uh, doing single fire and follow one of the uh, old humor that she's so showing uh, the direction of the rest of the, uh, the head and look like they're all more interested to follow her behind. Let's have an opportunity here. Maybe I'm not able to see. It's a little bit thick, but I believe, I'll stop here. I believe. This is it's more interesting to watch this elephant and the way they move, they're doing single fire all the time. The big one and they all follow. This is more important. I've seen a lot of animals out in nature. All the uh, predators sometimes they do, they have this uh, behavior. You get to see impala and all elephants. Giraffe. This is more important when they move into the area is to confuse predators because if they're long chain, it's not easy to break that. You don't know if you're predators, where you're gonna start, where's the safe point to really separate the head because all of them, they're highly, highly protected. If they're single far like that, a lion will look at them and get confused, not have courage in, even to hunt. You get to see Impala do that. It confuses the species itself. A long chain, you will stay there as a predator and watch and signify which the best, where to start, and it will be really confusing. Is how actually this is part of the, of course, of uh, defined mechanism that they have or that they use around in the area. The elephant are moving none of our property very thick, they're going southwards. And uh, of course, as I read on the ground, also, as I mentioned earlier on, hyena going on that direction, elephant going in that direction. It could be just because of the wind, of course. Connor, thank you so much uh, for elephant, for your comment, really appreciate it. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thing to see early in the morning. I really, really respect the way this animal is moving. It could be due to the weather, of course, wind, it might be involved. So let us head more east and we might get to see more animal coming from the direction where, from our direction and heading more to the southwest. I hope for my ribs and uh, Tandy also do the same. This is the area where Mariz and Tandy were last seen. They were on the kill by the report of our neighboring guides. So we'll take this opportunity to check around. I know that there was quite a lot of vehicle early this morning. This is a high, it's a highway or savage road. Everyone has to drive this road from moving from one lodge to another. But I still believe that uh, Tandy she has to cross here, or maybe she is already crossing the area. Lovely, we'll be li linking back to Chris. We'll find the same animal that uh, I was really viewing. Uh, enjoy the alleys with Chris. Yeah, this morning's just getting better. Just look at that. There's something about elephants in this type of weather. You know, it's, I don't know, it's just... We're just gonna 
said, yeah, they're approaching us, and I've repeated this many times, that I always like it if you have elephants at a distance and they're coming towards you. So therefore you give them the choice what they want to do. And if they're comfortable with the car, they'll, they'll come close and you'll be safe. Oh, that's a very old cow. You can just see how deeply sunken those temples are. A sign of maturity. Hi there, Thelma. Uh, Thelma wants to know if elephants ever get goosebumps. Yo, that's a tricky one. <laughs> I've never seen it. Uh, in theory, I'm sure they are capable. I mean, they have much less hair. Now, remember, goosebumps is basically uh, just the hair basically being erected, basically. And we see this with antelope where they puff the hair up, birds and so forth. Uh, so I'm sure they have the capability, but whether the need for it is there, uh, I'm not entirely sure. That's one of those questions I'll have to research, but... See, the purpose of goosebumps is twofold, you know. If you've got fur or dense hair cover, uh, it's firstly to erect the hair and to trap a layer of air, which will create a bit of a blanket. And secondly, if you're afraid or uh, when there's a threat, you also get goosebumps and that also makes your hair puff out and it makes you look bigger. Now, we as humans retain that, although the purpose of it is not really, you know, as important. The thing with elephants is they... <sighs> In terms of thermoregulation, for them it's probably more important to get rid of heat rather than to retain it. Now, in spite of their size, they've got a relatively small surface area compared to their weight. And that's why they've got those massive ears. You know, those are literally their radiators. So for them, it's more trying to get rid of excess heat rather than retaining it. Weather like this is perfect. I just love it. Good morning, Kisha. And Kisha wants to know at what age does elephant cows start breeding? Hi there, Kisha. Um, usually late teens, sort of like 16 and onwards. That's when they are, they are physically or, you know, physically capable. I thought it would be late teens. In fact, I think I might have misheard the question. Uh, it seems like you ask when they stop breeding. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, well, usually they'll they'll breed probably well into their late forties. Uh, 
basically, I would say late 40s, early 50s, then you would probably see them see them stop. Although I've seen some very, very old cows with calves. Um, so they start breeding in their late teens and generally stop breeding sort of late 40s, early 50s. But you do get exceptions. You know, you might sometimes see older cows like a, having calves. Hello Leslie, good morning and welcome to this live safari. Leslie wants to know how wide an elephant's ears would be if they're fully extended. Uh, a big bull, adult cow, yeah, I'm gonna judge quickly. You're probably looking at about, I would say about probably three meters-ish, two and a half, three meters. Yeah. I mean, that skull is about a meter wide. Each ear could well be a meter. Yeah, it's about three meters. That's big. <laughs> that was such a lovely sighting. All right, so they have moved off into the woods, and I don't think we should stay with them. They're very calm, but it's just again terrain. Uh, I don't like bashing after them into into these woods. Absolutely lovely. All right. It is true that most NFTs are on the Ethereum blockchain and vast amounts of computers are using massive amounts of energy to keep Ethereum running. By minting our NFTs on Polygon, it allows us to use the least possible amount of energy while still creating real incentives for our custodians to conserve the environments and habitats of these animals. Conservation really is conserving habitat. It needs to be saved in its context, and this context is the landscape it lives in. How important are the surrounding communities to conserve in Juma? Crucial. Conservation doesn't happen in a vacuum. If surrounding communities do not see the value, how could you expect them to buy into the idea of conserving? To have NFTs generate ongoing income it is just remarkable. 40% of the first sale and 8% of every V sale is rooted back to the Habitat custodian. Once 40% of that sale lands in the bank, it's very real. I was so excited to come across DJ or Demi James, Demi meaning half, and that refers to DJ's incomplete upper breastband. And what is so cool is that DJ has been building a nest, and we have also seen DJ hanging out with the partner. I cannot wait to see how the breeding season goes and bring you all the action from Penguin Beach. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you.
Welcome back live here we have hyena let me show you in front of us is really running to the east look like he might be going back to the den or responding on something let's take the opportunity to stay behind this hyena we might be lucky you'll never know what might be after in most cases hyena will respond on the leopard line kills in most cases we've just seen the tracks or we just spotted the tracks Cedric is behind me this morning also he just spotted the wonderful tracks of look like Maribs coming back from uh, Little Gari cross into our area and recross back into the area where he was spotted with a, a big uh, impala kill up in the tree. That means he's still on that particular area. The hyena started to cut across straight into the thick. Let's just try if we can manage to stay with this particular hyena.
Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, we are currently here at uh, Weaver's Nest. We are following, we are following uh, a hyena to disappear into the thick bush here. We would like to apologize for our technical problem that you are experiencing. Of course, uh, it's really one of the day here where it's very cloudy and a little bit raining. It does have interference, quite a lot of things. Let me see if I can check three house for us and see if there's anything around uh, the waterhole. Maybe 
you'd never know. This is the area, of course, where you might get to see leopards, honey badger, lions. Even if you haven't seen tags of a lion, it might happen that the lion are in a property. Because sometimes you tend to see lions that are nomadic. They might come from west, they might come from east, or north, south. We haven't checked our inspect the whole area of our territory if there's any lines or anything that might not be in the area. So that can happen. The water source, it really brings quite a lot of species, especially lions that uh, really prefer to ambush all the time, waiting for animal coming down to the water, especially in a very hot day. I just spotted something very interesting called water bug. A water bug. So you can see right in front of us one water bug just go behind the bushes and try to really hide away and focus on that in the little bit of window. It's our actually water bug. It gets to defend themselves. Standing behind the colors of water bug, of course it's really blend when blended into the environment. If you look at uh, most of the environment trees in the area as we drive, they're grayish in color. So that white circle on the bottom that's called follow mechanism, they follow one another, uh, eyeing on the white patch. Welcome to and beyond Ngala Private Game Reserve, where the magic of Africa comes alive. We are privileged to once again include this magnificent reserve and its array of animals to your screens in our daily live safaris. On a live drive here in the African wild. To celebrate, we are offering an unforgettable three nights stay for two at and beyond Ngala Safari Lodge for one of our lucky explorers. Tucked under a canopy of Mopani and Tambuti trees, Ngala Safari Lodge offers a variety of activities such as twice daily game drives, intimate wildlife encounters, eye-opening bushwalks and much more. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the 15th of March and you will be entered into the draw. Wild Earth Explorers it's in your nature. Identifying individual African penguins can be extremely challenging because at first glance, they all look the same. Identifying Duo, an African penguin with a double breastband was extremely exciting for me. Less than 5% of the African penguin population has this unique variation in plumage. And I can't wait to share Duo's life with everyone on Wild Earth. This warthog is in big trouble. He's got elephants all around. What are you gonna do there, big guy? What are you gonna do? Oh, he's pretty brave though. Oh man, he's not even moving. Look, that elephant is trying his best, but that warthog ain't budging. That's madness, that's so funny. And we have a winner. The warthog wins the standoff. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth, daily. Funniest question I've been asked. Oh, there have been so many. Uh, you could almost do a little anecdote book just on guest questions. Uh, sort of been asked, do you know which trees do elephants roost in? That's a tough question to answer with a straight face. Someone asked me if a windsock was for feeding giraffes. <laughs> There's our own little mini Maasai Mara. There's a little open area around quarantine. We just happened to cruise through here on route to a different area and I just had to stop and look at this herd of wildebeest.
There's about probably about 20, 25 of them here, which in our terms is quite a large group of wildebeest. And there's that huge herd of impala that we often see on quarantine as well amongst them. lovely also with the doves in the background it's such a serene and tranquil scene there. interesting now that I've mentioned the Maasai Mara you'll find that the wildebeest well here's a big guy on the left anyway um, the wildebeest here in southern Africa, uh, the, uh, the same species, it's, it's, it's blue wildebeest. Uh, but the species we have here, we commonly refer to as the brindled gnu, or blue wildebeest. And the ones you see in the Maasai Mara up in East Africa is the white bearded gnu. Or common wildebeest, as they call it there which is a subspecies of the same species. Now, they've got these white throat beards, their horn structure is slightly different. And what we've also seen is, especially the bulls in this area, uh, they tend to be more stocky, uh, slightly more robust. And Basically, up in East Africa, they build more for migration, and down here, you know, there's nowhere to migrate to because of the rain patterns. That's very different. So, therefore, the bulls are much larger to hold territories throughout the year. Hi there, Toby. Uh, good morning. And Toby wants to know if I've seen the migration. And you know what? It's number one on my bucket list. I've been to East Africa. I've just not seen the migration yet. So I'm really hoping to somehow find a way to get up there, whether it be the Serengeti or the Mora, to witness that spectacle. Yeah, it's truly something that, that, that should be on any naturalist's bucket list. It's, it's, I can just imagine sitting in an open area like this and as far as you could, literally as far as you can see, there's wildebeest around you. One day, one day. Maybe I should wait until my boys are old enough and take them up there. <laughs> well, let's go over to Rexon. Rexon is doing some birding. Welcome back. Uh, really, we are joining three houses. Then later on, we were with the water buck. We, we can hear different sound of different species of birds in the area. European bee eater. Uh, Egyptian goose, a lot more to, to mention. We are lucky now. We see this uh, Egyptian geese up in a tree, in a different uh, sort of a tree, one to the left, one to the right, which all of them they were talking earlier on when we get into surrounding. This kind of a behavior sometimes, if they spotted something as far as a leopard, they take off from the ground and go up in a tree, which is their safety. Or oh, seeing wild dogs, they know that of course, they're more vulnerable. They will go up in the tree and try to really be in a safety position. Such amazing 
each and every species out here, according to the history of Savisens, Juma, and all these different sort of farms that in the area. I was lucky, grew up in the area, born in the surrounding, and quite no history background of the area. If you look at the Egyptian geese, Predominantly, these species are coming from Egypt, I have no doubt, are more popular in the area. How Egyptian geese landed into the area of Sarisens? Hardly here there was no Egyptian geese. If I really was to uh, ensure if someone that uh, watching uh, Safari Live this morning, you will really state this. This is started down west from our farm in an area called Ottawa. The old man. Uh, really brought these uh, Egyptian geese and they started to farm them around in that sp specific area. I'm talking about early 70s is where they have started up to late uh, 80s and release them. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. It happens that they all went in different dams, different location in the area. Since from then, the population is everywhere around service centers. Same are plants. The elephants started down south. They were having bombers of an elephant in the, in the service centers. And by today, lucky enough, some of the elephants come from the East Africa and come down here in Mozambique. They're now everywhere. Of, of course, rhino is the same. There are hardly no rhino in the area. They used to come from the south of our neighboring area. They used to farm them malamal in the early days and release them. Suddenly today, you find everywhere around in the greater Kruger and, and, and the uh, service ends itself. So it's a history background, all of that, uh, because I'm born in the area, I know exactly the history background of this surrounding where it started. Well, a very interesting, you ask a very interesting question which sometimes uh, I might uh, really... It's same as you, Lola. Let me say that, uh, uh, you know, the route to Jobek and come back N4, N1, where you go, wherever you want to go, in and out. The species itself, they have that ability to know the area very well, even migrating from one place to another. They can really, if we're able to identify markers in the area, this is Lebombo Mountain, this is Drunkersberg Mountain, all those mar markers that you have put around in the area, they also have an ability. For instance, let them take an example, species that come from Europe and visit Africa. Of course, there's a right time of the year which they follow the season of the rain. They follow rain, they follow, it could be whatever, it could be a thermal, it could be anything. They know that this time, if this uh, kind of uh, storm going in that direction, it's time for us to follow the storm. Wherever the storm ended is the area that we want to be. It is in their nature. They know all of that. They can move in and out in the area following uh, season, following food, following everything. So it's actually they landed in, in the right position for themselves. So I want to go to America. I know exactly where to go. I uh, need from Africa to there. I might not know how to go there, but I'll know that I'll, if I catch this plane, I'll be in this area and able to go. They have same mentality that we do, but it's different because we cannot interpret in their mind of the species itself how exactly. Most of the things that we say is a prediction. Also, whatever in a book, it might be predict. Most of them, 80% is prediction. But the species itself, I think myself personally, that they have an ability to think like us. I hope I've answered the question correctly. If not, uh, it, it will be, yeah, colleagues will also carry on with this uh, question uh, in the afternoon to tell exactly, but uh, I was trying to uh, make sure that we all equal as wild animals. It's the same as when the animal migrate in East Africa, wildebeest from Tanzania up to Kenya, they, they know exactly following the uh, rainfall, of course, food, which is more important. Animal come from Zim, Mozambique, 
up to here in service sense kruger they follow the uh, migration rainfall food which is more important they know exactly where they're going is that area they cannot uh, really get lost but still with the egyptian geese which is uh, right sitting up in a tree waiting to start off. Bright colors and it attracts the insect to the flower, which is exactly what we're watching right now. This is so exciting. Good. Hi. 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 The smallest baby blackback jackal I have seen in the wild. Look how full the belly is. <laughs> it is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin. They just make me feel alive. That is incredibly sweet. Grooming each other. Play is vital. This is how they learn. This is how they would tackle prey. There you go, there you go. Heart is pumping right now. Look at this, everybody. We've got a live kill. There's nowhere to go. It's just such an incredible privilege to be out here. It just keeps on delivering. There she goes, going for the youngster. She got it. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. This is insanely good footage. We decided just to sit here with this wildebeest and impala. It's just such a lovely experience, just watching them. And like I always say, you know, we, as much as we love the leopards and the dogs and elephants and all the high-profile species, you know, just a scene like this is so important because we tend to sort of almost thought to neglect things like Impala and Wildebeest. And especially a herd like this, which is so calm with a car, Interesting, the name Wildebeest is basically taken from a Dutch word that, if you translate it, it means wild cow or wild cattle, uh, which is also quite interesting because they, they, they're antelope, they, you know, they've. Uh, 
probably related to, to cattle. Remember, antelope, cattle, goats, sheep, they're all in one big family called the Bovidae. And from there you divide them into different tribes. So sheep will be one tribe, uh, cattle is one tribe, and then antelopes are then divided in different, different tribes. You don't have an actual official taxonomic grouping antelope. But anyway, buffalo, African buffalo, are literally wild species of ox, or cow, are much closer related to domestic cattle as opposed to wildebeest or wild cow. Hi there, Molly, and I love that question. Uh, Molly wants to know if wildebeest is a, if they related to buffalo. Um, and it's exactly, and just to continue on what I just mentioned, so yes and no. Uh, so they are in the same broad family, uh, Bovidae, uh, which is a family within the order of ruminants, which are split hoofed creatures that ruminate with a four chambered stomach. So the next division is family. So the family Bovidae or Bovids includes things like uh, all the, the antelope, sheep, goats, uh, and cattle-like creatures. Um, so therefore they are related. But the next division will be tribe. So cattle will then be placed in their own tribe, the Bovini. Uh, for instance, all the spiral horned antelopes are classed in a tribe, the Tragolapini or the spiral horns. Impala, in fact, are in their own tribe. Uh, uh, wildebeest are grouped with, uh, uh, I can't remember the actual name for it, but uh, wildebeest, hartebeest, springbok, blessbok, uh, topi, tetebi. Those, those creatures are all in, in the same tribe. And then waterbuck, for instance, is classed with things like reedbuck and, and mountain reedbuck and uh, rearbuck and those things. They are their own tribe. You know, so, it's, it's, uh, so they are related in terms of the broad family, but as a tribe, they are in their own separate tribe as opposed to the cattle-like creatures. these type of answers you have to sort of strip them down in order to fully understand how they interrelate in terms of species Um, I like that question. So what happens to the females if the male impala dies? All right, let's, again, I like to strip these questions down into, or the answer into components, right? So in a herd, which is basically dominant male harem with his group of females, and every year around about May, the males battle for possession of these groups. So the territory comes with the female. So if the leading male dies, the females will probably remain in that area until the next rutting season, um, when the males again start fighting. But you'll often find within a herd, there's still some younger males that are subordinate to the main uh, male who's in possession of this harem. Um, in order to just keep them sort of herded up and keep them, you know, safe and so forth. So it's not a major train smash if, if, if that happens. It's, remember, in terms of breeding, it won't have any effect uh, because the only breed in, or, you know, mating takes place in May just after the rut. Um, and it's a brief period, you know, probably about a week or two. So once that's done and they and, and the females are pregnant, you know, from a breeding perspective, it won't have any effect.
And having said that, you know, especially a large herd like this, you would probably find that it will be unlikely that they'll lose that male to predation or, you know, other than the babies when they're born. In a big herd like this, it's not easy to, to catch one of these. I mean, we've seen Tlalamba now two days in a row, the same herd of Impala and no success. It's just too many eyes and ears. And they most of the time detect the predators well in advance. You'll find that the smaller herds, the splinter groups, solitary males, those are the ones that are much more at risk. <laughs> Good morning, Clara. And Clara's question is, what colour would I describe, you know, the colour of, you know, wildebeest? Sure. Craig? <laughs> Can I pass that on to you? I don't know. It's, it's sort of like... A... I can't really say dark grey. It's just like charcoal almost. But like a light, shiny charcoal. I'm sure there's some official name for the colour. I, I don't know. You've got that dark stripes, that brindling. But that's not a colour, it's more a pattern. In my language, you know, Afrikaans, we refer to it as blue, but not, not blue, blue, like the blue colour, but we also refer to it as blue. Yeah, I reckon I'd go for like a, like a washed out charcoal. <laughs> Anyway, let's um, see what uh, Rexon is up to on his bumble. I'm back from uh, Chris, so I'm right here at Trugaru Man heading east. We had more or less west of us in Pala Laming. They might be still inside uh, our neighborhood, maybe Lapet coming our direction. So we're coming to investigate the area. While we were at Tree House, we had this uh, Impala going mad. So it's important to check down here. If it's um, ribs, that will be a huge benefit for us to see because we will see our main aim coming down in this road called Garimane. If you look at down here, you have one of these guana species called oxpecker. And oxpecker is one of the species that are very, very good when it comes to cleaning other species. They have a very good symbiotic relationship, of course, with the impala. Unfortunately, it's moving away. It's just hosted on the Impala to our left. But uh, again, with the Impala right here at the route, as you can see, who knows, it could be them that are uh, making a lamb call in the area. So investigate in and out in the surrounding. It will be the best from us. Impala will lamb in order to really make sure and ensure any predators that might try to hunt them that is now being seen we are all aware you have no chance to come very close that's raising the impala when they get to see any predators do will do alarm calling it helps quite a lot for us also because if they start to alarm call we know that uh, we're all the time full of predators we would like uh, also to go down in that particular area to investigate very common if you look at all the males here the males there will be always at the outskirts of a dominant male with a female of course if uh, really a male lose when you lose power because mating in most cases in most 
in, in a rat season of uh, rutting season, the female itself will start to run around with that control. These guys here, they will know that the male with the impala is no longer in the status to pass the healthy gene, is getting weak. Remember, survival of the fittest. If you're not fit, you will always uh, really challenge. So all of these males here, there might be more than 10 or whatever, they have all hierarchy, number one, two, three, as it goes. They know one another who is now a dominant here. If a male that uh, really with the female loses, you'll take over as a dominant uh, priority number one. This is how it actually works in, in nature of the impala. So all the time, these dominant male or these males or bachelor boys, they're not going to go far away with the female. They are waiting all the time. You might find that the head might be on the left into a big open space. These guys, they will roam around and make sure they control out the female or the uh, dominant male that's mating is still in the right position. If not, they'll take on. It's in the nature of impulse how actually it really works in most cases. Yes, of course, you might find that if he... Liam, you're asking if uh, the impala horns are hollow inside. By the look of things, yes, inside the earth, there's reason you find that if you find two impala fight snapped off, you can see that hole inside. It does. It could be uh, my experience, but uh, by the look of things, even coming close, you take the impala horn, you see that hole inside. Really, really interesting. You see all of them, these guys, they really have horns for all males. If you compare them in the East Africa impala, same species, but what would be uh, really surprising you, the East Africa species or East Africa impala, their horns are so big. And why it's like that? These guys here, yeah, they don't really travel like the East African impala do. Going down for water, they travel kilometers to the water. They're so fit and strong. And they have a lot of more grass in East Africa than these guys they're eating in mix up. And they're always lazy. About 50 meters, both sides, less than 100 meters, there's a water hole. So they don't use quite a lot of their energy walking and be exercise and get more stronger. It's the same in, in our nature. If you exercise, you build muscles. If you don't exercise, you would never build muscles. So the guys that are in the East, because they exercise a lot, they build the muscles, they look stronger and bigger than the one we have here. So of course, even myself, I've started to exercise and lift and walk a lot, then my muscles, I will look more intimidating when I walk into the bush. From all species, how actually you get respected out in nature? If you walk here with the lions and leopard and elephant and all these kind of species that you compete as human beings, if you present yourself very weak, you are likely to be challenged. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a wild earth explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It feels amazing. So nice to see the people and uh, interacting with everything, how it works with the cameras and the switching with the vehicles. I like it very much. It's very cool. I decided to take a ticket to Dream. I'm a founder member, so the first time Wilder needs some help, I did it too. And I think it's a nice thing to, to help them that they can broadcast every day here. My favorite part all about today is to see Ribbon. I was surprised she was there. 
a Piet Kingfisher. I was looking for them the whole time. And uh, the, the drive to the Milwaukee, it was awesome. My favorite part of Wild Earth is uh, the connecting people with, uh, with the wildlife. I look every day, most two times, and you really get part of a family here. That, that's like very much. This is incredible. <laughs> Looks like vivid monkeys do sometimes go for swims. And I heard something splash, but we couldn't see what it was in the long grass. Now I just saw that thing swimming there. This is incredible. I hope it gets to the bank. There are crocodiles in this dam. And shoo, it looks like, you see that monkey climb up into the tree? Wow. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. I am an outdoor photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, and a conservation storyteller. Penguin Beach is going to offer us this really unique opportunity to watch and pick up on the smallest of details in the penguins' lives. It's going to allow us the time to really get to know these penguins well, get to know their story, and get to interpret the little finer details and share that with you with a live TV show. And get you. So we were just sitting with that herd of uh, wildebeest where we were earlier and we heard to our west, we just heard this sort of distress call, uh, which to, to me sounds like perhaps a small antelope, a diker or a steenbuck. Uh, and uh, possibly Tlalamba that may have taken one. Um, only thing that we have to work on is a direction, which is somewhere there, very sort of broad, but it does definitely, definitely, at this, you know, it could have been a young impala as well, but it, uh, I sort of get the feeling it's a, it's a daker. They, they make those calls when they, when predators get hold of them and they're not instantly killed, you know, so. So we'll just keep an eye out now. The problem is once the animal expired, it's not going to make those noises anymore. So it's not like alarm calls in Impala that you can sit and listen and okay, there they are and you can try and sort of maneuver. But oh, it's getting chilly. The long shot, if it's not close to the road, we probably won't see anything, but... The other thing is, if I've... Well, well Craig and I heard it from a couple of hundred yards away. Then the hyenas will also have heard it, if they're around. Okay. Good morning, Claire. Claire wants to know which is my favorite area on Juma. Um, I'm gonna name two. I'm gonna name a favorite area and then a favorite road. How about that? Quarantine is by far my favorite area. I love this open and sort of plains type of vibe. There's always something happening here. It's a very productive area and it's pretty. Uh, then my favorite road is Drakensberg. And you drive that road in the afternoons and you look westwards, you just have this stunning view of, you know, the escarpment to the west. And if you can get a sunset there, it's even better. So that's my favorite road from, you know, scenery. And my favorite area will be quarantine. But I like them all. It's... Okay, this must be, because there's the Impala over there. And this is more like here. Yeah. So let's just take this road around and check. Uh, I don't know, Craig, what's your opinion? We were there and we heard it. Yeah, it's in, in this block between her. Yeah. Okay. 
So let's just circle the block. Yeah. You can circle the block and see. Just got down, feel almost dead. Come back and Rebecca's around. Good day, Kenneth. And Kenneth wants to know if animals get flu. Um, Kenneth, they do. Um, science have identified a number of influenza viral strains that infect animals. Uh, bird flu, swine flu, um, animals out here, definitely. It's been reported. Um, uh, most of those are, however, not a th necessarily a threat to us. I mean, the influenza virus is, as far as I understand, and um, again, I'm not a virologist or a doctor, but from what I understand, is that it's there's so many different strains of it. You know, some only affect certain species. Uh, some are zoonetic, so they can move over different species, and so they do. I mean, just people tend to forget that as humans, we are also mammals, just like the animals out there. So animals as well. They they pretty much get most of the conditions that we get. They get the bacterial infections, they get viral infections, they get colds, they get flu, they get cancers, they get, you know. Uh, I do, however, believe that they are much stronger than us in terms of their sort of system. They seem to be able to take a lot more punishment than we can are able to absorb. I've seen animals recover from horrific wounds. Zebras, which has got like their whole bum ripped open. And that's a wound that will put us humans in hospital with antibiotics and all sorts of things and stitches. And, and they heal, you know. You know, the animal world is just fascinating. It's just Goodness, she just brought my jacket this morning. Starting to shiver a bit here. Come on, Tlalamba, show your face. Show us what you've killed. Well, while we look for our cat, let's head over to JP. It sounds like he managed to relocate his cats. Good morning and welcome back to Eco Training Pro Islands. We quickly had to flee from the rain and we had to go and keep our equipment dry for a while. Luckily the rain has now stopped and that's provided us with the opportunity to come back and come and find our lions. I was hoping that they were and still be here and they were. And sometimes when you do get back, they unfortunately have moved off and you have to start the whole tracking process from the beginning. They've not been up to much. I see they're still in the same position as if they were earlier. As one of them that occasionally lifts their head and just looks around at what's going on. I also noticed that as that I approach them, there's a group of impala that actually walked very close past to them. I wonder actually what happened with the impala, and most likely they either walked past them or the lions showed no interest, or they might have got a very, very big surprise the moment that these lions actually did look up at them. So we're just going to see what they're going to get up to and while they're busy we have their heads down and resting as well as occasionally looking up. If there's anybody that would like to ask any questions about lions, you are more than welcome because it's unlikely that by this time of the day that they're going to do anything. 
although it's even cool and overcast today, we still find that there's moments where the sun breaks through the cloud and it does become quite warm. Even for myself at the moment, my fleece is actually getting too, too much for me. And for lions, they overheat very quickly. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the show. Yes, I love those black markings as well, and I love that little black marking on the tip of the tail. And if you are not aware for what their function is, their function is actually as following mechanisms, as well as it can assist with expressing mood, especially when a lion turns their ears to the front and they want to actually say to somebody else, listen, you are annoying me. And we also will often notice that when the cubs move with the adults, that is also a method of of actually keeping contact with uh, adults, but also when they're hunting because they become entirely quiet when they hunt and they become so focused, there's no visual vocalization. They just simply keep contact of where one another are by means of a ear as well as the tip of the tails, which they will then be able to see. We see that there's quite a few of the different cat species that have got black markings behind the ear. However, when it comes to domesticated cats, there's no black markings behind the ear. But still, when a cat turns its ears towards you, that's just generally indication of that they are annoyed. We also see with a wide range of other animals that there's specialized markings which also act as following markings. And we see that with kudu, which has a white underpart to its tail, and also with a number of different antelope species, and that they also can maintain group cohesion and follow one another as they move through thick vegetated areas. Impala, also most likely with back parts to a ear, but also most likely acts as a following mechanism combined with a M-shaped marking on the back end of the buttocks. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hopefully they will actually do something out of the norm. Get up and do something and um, in the meanwhile let's go and see what Rexon is up to. Welcome back uh, from JP with the Pride of Lions. We are in Sands. We are just spotted the lovely, lovely bird of prey. Warbeck's eagle. It's difficult because of the silhouette or backlight of uh, the area. This is one of the uh, Warbeck's eagle, which it, it looked like one of the dark morph Warbeck. We have uh, quite few uh, colors of Warbeck's that in the area. We have dark brown and uh, white pale morph and the lighter one. So it is difficult for us, also for you, to be able to see is a light one or dark one or white morph, but it looks like in between, it, it looks like a dark morph or back eagles. It's one of the eagles, of course, that hunt in the area, hunt something small, francolins and all the species of bird and able to eat uh, small snakes around in the area. I've seen warbucks before, they can even land when leopard left the kill up in the tree, if they have the opportunity, they will go and scavenge. This is very interesting. Again, the species itself, it migrates up to the highland of Ethiopia. You tend to see them, especially people that visited uh, <clears throat> Kenya, you were able to see a big flock of uh, eagles across Niger I mean, the uh, Kenya and head straight to Ethiopia on that direction. They will be all over. That is really, really interesting to see the when the migration takes place. I've seen here before. On safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire, with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. 
that you have gone through the operation and treatment that I had to have uh, subsequently meant that I lost a lot of energy. And so Wilder was brilliant to be able to sit down for the afternoon and escape being on a live drive at Juma. Just um, absolutely amazing to actually be sitting on Jimbo Druid Word Dam is just awesome. I look forward to seeing any of the animals. I think it's so nice to be able to see them in their natural habitat. My favourite part for today has been going on a bumper with Lauren. Wild Earth has been particularly helpful, and if anyone's going through hard times out there, Keep going, you can handle it, and it will get better. The sun will rise tomorrow. Our bodies are made up of about 60% water, which means that in a very short space of time, you can dehydrate completely. A relatively efficient way of collecting water early in the morning is to take an absorbent material like a sock and to walk through the grass absorbing the condensed dewdrops on the grass. Once the material is saturated, you can then squeeze it out into a container or you can suck it out directly into your mouth. It's a huge privilege to be in these incredible places with these amazing animals. I love forming lions. When they do get up and do something, it's always spectacular. When they are playing, are incredibly fun to watch, especially sub adults and cubs. I love being in the bush and working in these incredible places with these amazing animals. We want to bring it to you so that you can almost feel like you're right there and be able to experience it and enjoy it the way we are. Welcome back. Oh, we're still with the beautiful Warbex eagle sitting in this tree here. This is more important, of course, seeing all the eagles, that means the ecosystem is still well balanced in the surrounding. Of course, if you look at the area where we are in service and Juma, you still have animal that you consider the part of the very important in the ecosystem. We still have eagles that are here, we still have jackals, we still have quite few species that really, if you look at other part of the uh, reserve, you hardly don't see even jackal, you don't see quite a lot of things. I'm happy if I drive around here, <clears throat> meaning the of ecosystem, when the ecosystem is very balanced, you have to see, you have to get uh, all species like jackal, you have to all the hyenas, you have to all of them, as I mentioned, vultures and all, all of them together. That is very important to have them, I mean, practice or have them active in your area. As reason, in most cases, you cannot learn if these species, are, some of them are not uh, really in, in, the, in the area, of course. For instance, let me take an example. When the animal die, you read from the... Um, of vultures. When the animal die in the bush and you cannot have access, is in the thick, you read hyena, hyena will tell you. Jackal, when they get to see a lion and everything, jackal will give you lamb calls. It, it's such amazing if how all of them connected and they benefit from one another. If something die and not investigated by vultures, if a, a jackal gets into that area and find a dead animal and they're not sure whether it's dead or not, they start to call hyenas and other species, leopard and so forth, they will respond on that area. It's really amazing how things works and how things connected out in the bush. Raining, of course, it, it really uh, put uh, all species not to be not active. If you look at that uh, uh, Warbeck's eagle, he's sitting there. As soon as he gets wet, he has to uh, not to fly and make sure he gets dry himself before he take off. And very importantly, you see that he is now in a dead tree. It's actually, in nature, it's more, more important sometimes to have an elephant in the area. As you can see, the tree itself is dead. It will able for the warbucks and other eagles of course like an area where they can sit high without any branch they can see when they get to hunt or get to see their enemy because sometimes they do have enemies what might be of course think about eagle if the eagle is there and it's an african rock python it's very easy 
to get hunted. Let me take uh, back a link to uh, JP Pradland with a beautiful uh, part of lines. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We were just as jealous of Ericsson earlier on finding those wild dogs and we're of course finding leopard. But we really enjoyed our buffalo sighting as well as our lions so far this morning. And as these lions tracks would actually lead us to the buffalo. However, we didn't find the lions first. We eventually had to backtrack on our tracks again. And then we managed to actually find the lions. And most likely we're following that breeding herd of buffalo for a short while to see if there was any weaknesses in their defense or any sick or injured animals that they could potentially capitalize on. However, for them, with only two adults in the group and four sub-adults, it's very unlikely that they will actually be able to actually go for a healthy buffalo. As what you do need quite a lot of strength to pull down an animal which is almost weighing 800 kilograms in weight, and that's a weight for a full-grown bull. Our bulls in South Africa are also quite tiny in comparison to those in East Africa, which weighs just slightly over 900 kilograms and that's going to take a lot of land power to bring down such a big buffalo. At the moment we see that they're mostly resting, every now and then the heads are being picked up. And the one that we are looking at the moment was yawning a little bit earlier and is yawning now again. It's possibly that it is an indication that it might get, no, man, he's not getting up. Good morning, Gordon, and welcome to the show. And with your question, what will happen if he loses his tail? Absolutely nothing. I have seen quite a few lions that don't have tails. Um, and once or twice I've actually seen where the tail was actually bitten off by other lions. And I've also seen where they've actually attacked one another on the weakest part, and that is the scrotum at the back. Um, and that's especially young males that do that towards one another. Uh, but so yeah, it won't influence it at all. I have seen both hyenas, lions, zebras, elephants, and a host of other animals that has no tails. But a tail is pretty helpful quite often helps to keep the flies away from your backside and that's probably the only hindrance that it's going to have for that animal. But earlier, this one that we are looking at the moment was also grooming, and it almost looked like if it wanted to cough up a fur ball there. We mentioned a few days ago that their tongues are like sandpaper, and that assists them to removing fur or for prey, where they want to start feeding, but also to remove lowest fur off their own coats, and of that of one another when they are grooming one another. That's quite interesting to them, see them actually regurgitating those pellets. Well, in the meanwhile, let's go and see what the rest of the group is up to. Peaceful surroundings, the nature, it's not something I can get in my homeland. So it's wonderful to be able to be live, you know, with, with you guys and feel like you're actually there. If you want to go on safari with a wild earth guide whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. With wild dogs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We don't always get to see those, so that's, that's just been amazing. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I wanted to be part of the support of Wild Earth. It brings so much um, to everybody and everything has brought so much to me, especially, you know, got me through some difficult times myself. I found Wild Earth shortly before I was going to go through some things in my, my own personal life, and it's what got me through, and I know that's a story for many, many, many people, so it's important to me to provide support to that.
Oh, 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 what are you doing? Are you trying out for the ballet? Now it's an itchy bottom. Up we get. Mom's coming. Everybody's moving off. My name is David and I love being a cam op because you get a front row seat to all the best sightings that Wild Earth has to offer. Sharing it with everyone else, well that's a perk too. What makes the Wild Earth experience magical? Well, it has to be the fact that it's live and interactive. The sighting that'll be ingrained in my brain for life, watching a lioness kill three wildebeest during the migration in the space of about 20 minutes. My spirit animal, that has to be a monkey. I was just saying that these um, swallows look rather miserable in this drizzle. And they can't really do much now. I mean, its feathers are wet. Insects are not flying around, so... Only thing left to do is find a place to perch and... wait until the rain stops and the feathers are dried. And you can see in the background there, there's just, you can see that sort of almost like misty. Rainy. Background, you know. Hello there, Waikisha. Uh, Waikisha just mentioned that nature is so incredible. And yeah, it's, it's just phenomenal. Yeah? And that's why I chose a career in nature. You know, it, 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 just, it, it, it never ceases to amaze you. And you just keep on learning new things. And, experience new things and like there's no two days that are the same i mean just take a morning like we had action factor leopard wild dogs lions buffalo you know i'm talking about across all our locations And in a way, this is such a perfect way to end it, you know. Something calm and relaxed, you know. It's, it's just sort of like... It's almost as if these swallows are trying to tell us, listen, you know, we know you had such a great time and... We all seem important. Come and take a look at us as well. Don't always only have to look at lions and leopards and so forth. Well, another morning comes to an end on our live safari and um, hopefully this afternoon we can continue on the success from this morning. Weather is good even though it's raining so I'm inviting you to join us this afternoon on another live safari. And Craig and I are looking forward to a large breakfast and 
and so we can get fueled up for the afternoon. And hopefully it will be action-packed again. So until then, keep well, goodbye, and we'll see you soon.